you're here to hear from the co-founders of Floyd, Kyle and Alex, and they're going to tell um, you about themselves better than I can. Um, last thing though, um, our amazing designer Matt created these cute little cards. Um, hi, we're so happy to have you here at Creative Morning, so please feel free to grab one, and um, that's it from me for now. So, Kyle and Alex. Thank you. So I, I'm uh, Kyle. I'm Alex. Pumped to do a uh, Creative Mornings. We had everybody um, here back in, uh, I think it was November, did, did a talk. Um, it, was, it was great. Or we didn't do a talk, but it was a talk here. Great. But um, for those of you who don't know about Floyd, we're a furniture company. Um, we uh, started about five years ago. Kind of our, our, our concept is we go really deep into you know, one furniture product per category of the home. So come to Floyd for a bed frame, a table, a bookshelf, which we're launching soon, which is uh, right on the other side of the wall over here. Um, we launched a sofa recently. We actually were launching that last time everybody was here. We, we got people to test it out. So um, uh, yeah, kind of the, the idea is that we're, we're really thinking deep about one furniture product and, uh, and, and really thinking about how we're solving a problem with that. Um, you know, we, we started the company again five years ago and it was you know, really to make furniture better. And we, we started out this reaction to the consumption of furniture and uh, the way people were purchasing it, using it for a year and throwing it away. Um, and, and we'll continue to tackle that in, in the next, you know, five, 10, 100 years. We want to really create Floyd as a, as a place people are going to buy really great furniture products. So with um, the prompt today, we asked to talk about symmetry. And just earlier, I was just chatting with some people and asked if Kyle and I were going to repel in symmetry in the skylights. And another question was if we were going to like come out in symmetry with like matching jumpsuits. So I feel like we're like, we're, yeah, so I feel like we're kind of grossly ill-prepared now. Uh, we'll redo it, we'll redo it. All right. Yeah, yeah. This is yeah. Still, we're, yeah. Uh, don't film this one. Um, but yeah, we were, we were talking more about this idea um, and, you know, something that we kind of you know, settled on was this idea of um, hidden symmetries and the idea that um, when people are trying to solve a problem and they come up against the wall and they've exhausted all possible alternatives, you know, they'll look from a different field or something to bring that idea in. And so there's this idea that there's hidden symmetries like everywhere around us. Some of them have been discovered, some of them, and many of them are, are still yet to be revealed. And so I think like we wanted to talk, just share some of our favorite stories of, of some innovations that have kind of come out of this idea. Um, so one of the, you know, one, one kind of famous example of this was with the story of Bill Bowerman, um, who was born in Oregon in the early 20th century and went to, fought in World War II, became a major in, in military there and came back to Oregon and got really into running. And he ended up becoming the University of Oregon running coach. And they ended up having, over 24 years of his, of his tenure, they had all but one uh, winning, winning season. And he ended up training about 31 Olympic athletes over the years. So this was somebody who was obsessed with running. And something he was also obsessed with was the weight of the shoe. Like, just he was so much about like, okay, if you had cut off a little bit of weight from a shoe, like how much will that weight be over the course of a mile? Um, and maybe can we, you know, cut, shave, shave some time there. And so he was really obsessed, obsessed with this idea. And he would make shoes and share them with some of his former players. And one of them was, was Phil Knight. And so he, he gave, a, you know, a pair of shoes to Phil Knight um, as, you know, Phil was trying to get a, a shoe company going. Um, and together they ended up, you know, founding this company called Blue Ribbon Sports, um, which started as a, a shoe distribution company. Um, and as part of that kind of journey, um, they had been in Japan, well Phil had been in Japan and had met with um, Onosuke Tiger, which is like a kind of Japanese shoe company, and he was having the conversation with the founder there, and the founder said, you know, I've got this vision that in the future, everyone in the world will wear athletic shoes, like it'll be a common, commonplace thing. Um, and so that kind of stuck with him, and, and um, as he was kind of going back and working on building the business, Bill Bowerman was still really just thinking about 
lighter weight shoe. Like he just kept going on it. And one day he was at breakfast, and his wife Wendy was. Um, they were sitting together and they were making waffles. And he just saw how the waffle came out of the waffle maker. And he was thinking like, hey, if you kind of use that, um, maybe that could be a really good bottom of a running shoe. You can get traction and stuff. So he went out and he concocted up some like melted plastics. I don't really know how, the, how you would necessarily do that. But he put it in the waffle maker, destroyed the waffle maker, but came up with this, um, with this shoe bottom. And like it had all the shoes at that time were really like flat. And so this idea that it could have the contours and give you kind of this extra bounce was um, you know, really, really important there. And so it was called the Oregon Waffle Shoe, um, which became the Waffle Runner and became a really core product of Nike. And so this product, um, and Phil and, and, and um, you know, Bill switching over from Blue Ribbon Sports to now creating their own shoes as Nike, um, that shoe, that concept has just basically been the core of how they've just you know, continue to continue to iterate, and it's been the core of their foundation. Just that kind of one idea. So it was like thinking about a really deep problem. He had been so deep in it, and he was really like a unique person to come up with that solution because he had been been so in that in that space. And I think it requires not just kind of and, and like not anyone can come up with something like that. But he was uniquely positioned to find find that connection. And I think today, if he saw the, the Duke basketball. Um, fiasco, he would be pulling out of his waffle iron and getting it fixed up. Um, but yeah, so I think that that's just kind of one example of, of that kind of idea. Yeah, and I think um, also also around the, the time of World War II, um, it's kind of another group of innovators that we look to a lot, and uh, people are moving back, um, you know, people moving back or coming back from the war, building homes, you know, thousands and millions of families are, are moving into new spaces. Um, and you know Charles and Ray Eames are, are really working on how do you how do you create you know furniture for the masses and, and think about good design and quality products for, for all, all people. Um, you know up until this point in time, you know the you know technology in, in chairs it was you know either wood or often you know sometimes aluminum. But but there were these new technologies that were coming out during during the war for for, for different reasons. Um, and uh, and at the time, uh, you know Charles and Charles and Ray. Um, had been producing, you know, splints for for the for the army, and and they were making them out of um, bent plywood, and and this was something that came out of you know their early research and in, in trying to make a chair out of, uh, of bent plywood. If you if you actually go up to Cranbrook, there's in their I don't know if anybody's been up, I'm not sure a lot of you have been up to Cranbrook, uh, but uh, the, in their vault they have um, one of the early chairs that um, that that the Eames and, and Saarinen had, had had produced for a competition that um, was really trying to like use plywood, bent plywood, to create a chair, which wasn't something um, commonplace at the time. Um, they ultimately failed and covered it in, in fabric because it splintered and it didn't work, but you can still see that chair in the, in the vault. Um, but this became kind of a, a theme for, for the Eames over time, that they were trying to, to really produce products at scale with new, new processes and technology. It, was, it wasn't about like, you know, creating these um, old style, you know, pieces of um, furniture from laid in wood and all these processes that took a long time, but what, what could you learn from new technologies? And, and the splint was one that, that they, they, they developed during the war, but also um, soon after, they, you know, they, they really dug into this idea of how do you create a chair that, that can be purchased by anybody, really taps into new process, like these, these new processes that were developed during the war, and, and they, they actually looked to this, this fiberglass plastic helmet and they saw that this was, you know, a, a product that could um, that could, you know, perform in double curvature. It, it wrapped around the head, protected, and and they, they took that technology and started really working with it, and and that actually led to the um, their their plat We actually have some of the chairs in the next room, but they should be in here so we can show. But uh, I forgot that. Uh, but uh, we but a plastic, you know, form chair that that then became ubiquitous, you know, in in the in the twentieth century as a, as a product that that could fit in in all types of homes. It was, you know. Thoughtful design. The structure of it was um, was serviceable, and, and you know ultimately, um, you know that's a product that has withstood the test of time, um, and, and and is a product that today is still used in, in schools. It's used in in you know great homes in in LA, and it's you know we use it here in our office. But um, but really taking um you know taking a challenge and, and kind of in the same way as uh, you know Bill Bowerman thinking about you know. How do I how do I pull in an idea from from kind of a distant place or a distant um, 
just in concept um, that was developed elsewhere to, to really tie it into to what I'm trying to solve. And there was um, an, kind of a, another example of this was with um, Joseph Woodland, and he was looking at, um, he was kind of this inventor, he had worked on the Manhattan Project, and then also got really into um, elevator music. Um, and so something he like figured out early on was that, this is kind of crazy, but like, Elevators used to have like LPs, literally. Like you, you would have like an LP system. Um, so don't take your elevator music for granted. But he basically, like, he basically took like 35 millimeter film stock and figured out like how to put 15 songs on it. So it was like this really smart thing. And so he was thinking about commercializing it, but his dad was really um, nervous that um, he felt the mob had a uh, monopoly on elevator music. So he's like, don't get mixed up in that. And so he like moved on from it. Um, but one, one time when he was at uh, engineering school, um, a, a local supermarket chain came to him and said, um, hey, we're trying to solve this problem about um, a way we can kind of document our, our product inventory more upon checkout. Do you have any suggestions? And so he started working on this problem and um, had been thinking about it for a while. And one day he was like at the beach and he was um, running his, his fingers through the sand. And it kind of reminded him of Morse code about how this kind of thought on how Morse code was like dots and dashes. And he thought as he was running his fingers through, what if um, he could use the width of a line to kind of create a code in a way. Um, and so he came up with like the, the first kind of um, barcode, which was actually a circle, the first one. Um, and it was, he tried a couple methods. It was going to be required like ultraviolet I mean, um, it required like a special ink, like fluorescent ink and an ultraviolet light, but that was super expensive, not scalable. And so the kind of idea went on for a bit and finally, you know, figured out a good way of doing it, but still it wasn't commercially um, scalable as it required like a 500 watt um, light to like scan a product. So it wasn't really like super useful. And so he sold the idea for $15,000 um, to another company. That idea was kind of shopped around to, to other companies over the years and then it was um, on Earth, um, years later, when um, a super uh, national association of um, retailers, like um, food retailers, came to this company and said, "Hey, we're trying to figure out the system. Do you have anything?" And they said, "Oh, yeah, we might have a technology here." And so they ended up developing um, universal barcode, which is now the barcode that that we see today. But it didn't just like simply like proliferate then and just like go out. It actually required, it's actually kind of a really boring story, which is that it required like a committee to basically come together, which was the grocery manufacturers of America coming together with the National Association of Food Retailers. And they sat down and said, hey, are we like, do we want to do this system? And it took forever, it took years. Because actually coming together on it was a really difficult idea because it required mass adoption and it required mass coordination because the manufacturers would have to change their packaging and put this barcode on and then the um, the retailers would have to get expensive scanners so it's like the chicken before the egg that whole kind of thing um, trying to decide it but finally they arrived at it and the first thing was Wrigley's gum was scanned in Troy Ohio in the mid 1970s was the first thing and these um, that barcode you know not only um, it had kind of an implication that it allowed, it wasn't very useful for small retailers because they didn't really need it, but it allowed for quick switchover of pricing, it allowed for managing complex inventory, it allowed for managing going from just food into electronics and stuff. So it actually led and opened up to the rise of like a Walmart. Um, it led to maybe the early days of what Amazon was, was capable of. So that simple kind of idea didn't really have legs until it was decided by a boring committee that it would you know, be unleashed. And so I think that that idea is important that, you know, from the Nike shoe required Nike, uh, you know, the waffle shoe required the backing of Nike's marketing dollars, required their business operations. The Herman Miller concept required, um, I mean, the, the Eames required Herman Miller, you know, to really bring that to the masses. So it's not just the idea and the connection is made and then it goes off, but it requires that distribution and, and that second piece to, to getting it out there. Yeah, and when we were um, we were kind of like thinking about this idea of like hidden symmetries, we uh, we kind of were kicking around like what like are all because I mean there were some bad ones and we're like are all you know these ideas often good and do they do create great, great things and um, I think there's you know a lot of large companies that are really really bad at tying two ideas together 
Um, and I think it could often be, you know, we kind of thought about it, and it's like kind of an often comes out of being sort of lazy with this kind of concept, and it's, you know, just trying to, you know, because you can type two things together doesn't mean you should do it. Doesn't mean you should put, you know, like, the Internet of Things is like the Internet of Everything. Like, a toilet doesn't need to necessarily connect to your phone. I mean, maybe it should, but I don't know. <laughs> you know, you don't need to have, like, rollers in your shoes. Um, people love those for a little bit, I guess, but uh, I think in general, like, if you, I think if, like, you know, you really think about, like, big, you know, companies that, like, really push, push something, like, maybe, like, the Google, Google Glasses or something like that, you know, they took, they took, something that was working for them and, and try to you know, push maybe a concept on people that, that wasn't something they really needed or, or was something to solve a problem. And, uh, and I think that you know, like when we were really like kind of digging into it, to understand the difference between you know, when we try to solve problems and, and maybe other people try to solve problems, what, what really creates something that, that can, can innovate and change? So with that kind of, um, you know, kind of cl close out of it is talk about um, a really important thing to Floyd, which is the ratchet strap, which I know you guys were all really <laughs> hoping we'd bring up um, and dive into. Um, but yeah, I think like it was about like five and a half years ago um, when kind of I started Floyd, and it really is kind of how I was talking earlier about um, you know reaction to disposable furniture and buying and throwing away furniture and. The table legs were the first product that we launched, which was introduced on, on Kickstarter. And after we had launched it, you know, our goal was 100 sets of legs that we wanted to sell. Um, and we ended up selling 1,400 sets of legs and raised quarter million dollars for that. And so that was kind of the initial traction that we felt that there was people out there that were interested in this idea, that it could resonate, and we wanted to you know, keep, keep building this and thinking about how the Floyd business would, would evolve long term and where we would go with it. Yeah, and so we, um, just after the Kickstarter, um, and those of you who aren't like, maybe familiar with the legs, that, that's one of them hanging on the wall over there. It's, it was just like basically uh, a table leg that can clamp to any flat surface. And the concept was like, hey, here's here's something that, you know, like buying furniture is tough. You, you know, like when you move, it often is something you just throw away. And with this product, you know, you take the legs, allow you to kind of upcycle something or, or customize something. and then. You know, throw it in a bag over your shoulder and, and take it to your to your next home. Um, you know, but one thing about the simplicity of that that we kind of ran into um, was that, you know we, we really tried to, to to say this is like for you know smaller surfaces for like an entry table. It's for a it's for like a, a, a coffee table and um, and it, but we actually you know like when we started to test materials we, we actually took it to this one this one like salvage yard um, not to be named in Detroit. It wasn't architecture. But, uh, but uh, and, and there was a guy there who was, like, took it and didn't even like really necessarily uh, understand the concept yet. And he was like, "Gosh, this is just, it's just a terrible table. It wobbles. You know, like doesn't this doesn't work?" And I think at that time, you know, we were really thinking about what is the next version of this this product and how do we, you know, we got this product out in the world and, and we found that people, you know, liked the idea. Um, and we hadn't even really shipped it yet. And you know, we had somebody telling us it was going to fail. Um, so that you know put us in a place where like. You know, we really need to figure out how do we like, you know, really go through the next version of this and and, and create some form of like cross bracing. Um, but you know, the challenge was that we were we were really thinking about that, and you know, the constraint of how we're shipping the product. It was you know, like we wanted to ship it in a small bag that, that could go to your door. Um, we didn't want to have like cumbersome cross bracing. It needed to have like varying length. Um, you know that we didn't want it just to be for one, you know, size table and have some sort of like bracket that connected across. And, and you know, ultimately, cross bracing what it does. Um, we have an engineer on our team now, so nobody worry about. <laughs> Neither Alex and I are engineers, but ultimately, what cross bracing does is it, uh, you know, keeps keeps everything, you know, like keeps connects you know, your legs across. And I mean, this seems very obvious maybe to everybody else, but but it connects everything across and, and holds it together. And, um, you know, it wasn't until uh, you know, right at that moment after that, you know, that uh, guy kind of let us know that it didn't <laughs> work that well. That we went to Royal Kebab up in Hamtramck and we were eating shout lunch. Shout out to Lamb Cocktail Sandwich, and you gotta get the lentil dip too. <laughs> but we were sitting there; it was kind of a rainy day, and it was just like, God, you know, maybe there is some way that we could do this in, a, in, a, in something that has varying length. And, and I think that was when, like, we kept digging in and, and really made this leap to, to something that we used when we moved. And uh, something that had varying length, it could hold things in place. And 
Um, as silly as the product you know, seems and often challenging as it is to use, um, we found that it did, it did solve that problem. And it was something that um, you know, then didn't require us to, to you know, this, this cost maybe $7 more is, is fabricating something that, that could be varying length, could you know, be a lot more parts. Um, a lot more, you know, chances to break, and uh, and also, you know, not nearly as cost effective. And and this was something we started, you know, testing, and, and you know, like testing on the product, kind of adapting the leg, and, and it really worked on how how could we bring, you know, something that like this to market. Yeah, and there was um, the first time that we had tested it, like the first year Kyle had, was living in North Cork Town, and we would work out of this place, and his roommates had like a lot of cats. Um, so there was a lot of cats like jumping around all the time, but we were like kind of gone to Ace Hardware and got got like this orange ratchet strap and we set it up in in his backyard for the first time. And we only had like at that point we the legs hadn't shipped yet, so we only had one like prototype kind of set of legs. And so we did the ratchet straps. And we were kind of like, all right, kind of I think it feels better. I think it's I think it's better, but we didn't have like the Thing to compare to, so it was like this pretty stringent testing process. Um, but we felt we felt good about it. Yeah, yeah it Dan, what you call that bit left testing? Oh, it's Anyways, it's really engineering joke, <laughs> insider joke there for engineers out there. Uh, but it, but yeah, I think like while that was kind of you know great to accomplish that. I, I mean, it ultimately, um, you know, this product then became sort of a, a foundation and consistent part in what you know. Became one of our bigger selling products, the bed frame. Um, you know, the the concept of it very much, um, you know, very much allowed us to, to to make something that was modular, eliminate a lot lot of parts, and, uh, and and create a bed frame that you know, unlike maybe IKEA's mom bed or a lot of other bed frames out there on the market, has has like 13 parts opposed to maybe 95 or 100 parts. Um, and it's you know a simple device. It's created by and we should know who it's created by. I don't know who it's created by, but it's a simple device that um, that yeah really really solves kind of like can solve solve that problem and uh, yeah, off the shelf, very utilitarian and, and yeah, not everybody also knows how to use a ratchet strap, so it's something we kind of have to coach people through sometimes. But um, but but I think at the end of the day, it's um, you know solves what we think you know what was kind of our problem and. And it felt like we were reaching into something, and still, and still do use it, but reaching into something that otherwise hadn't necessarily been thought about for furniture in the past. Yeah, and it, I think like overall, you know, the like the waffle shoe and the Eames chair and the barcode are are certainly things that have completely you know cha changed the global economy in our, in our world. And we're certainly not saying that the ratchet strap on on the bed frame maybe, maybe it'll have the impact of the barcode, but but um but I think it's more that that idea that spirit of of continuing to look for for those ideas outside your realm when you come up against a wall and, and a problem you're, you're trying to solve, and that yeah these things are all all around us and so I think for us like we'll continue to use that as an inspiration for for our team as we continue to run into you know challenges that might be on our business model or on our product line and thinking about how do we go beyond furniture, how do we think ourselves not as a furniture company, but an organization trying to solve a problem.